there. My name is Dr. Monica Agarwal. Thank you for joining me for another session of Seeking Voices of Hope, Healing, and Health. I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Will Bulsevics. Dr. B, as he likes to go by, as we all butcher his name too much, is an amazing gastroenterologist who focuses on nutrition and how you use nutrition to heal the gut, which then heals the body. He's published a beautiful book called Fiber Fueled and recently came out with a cookbook, which I've been privileged to have. And I'm love getting, I love getting into this book already. It's been super fun. Thank you for sending it. During this podcast, we talk about health, but also about hope and healing, because I feel like a lot of people are lost right now. They're sad and lonely and they're looking for help. I'm hoping that by telling stories, we can make people feel closer to each other and more hopeful. Each person is an onion. So much of the time we just see the outside layers. It takes time to peel back the layers though and see the colors and character inside. Everyone has a story and I look forward to hearing Dr. B tell his story and hearing his message of hope. Dr. B, Will, good to see you. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Monica. I'm excited to be here. Yes, thank you. So Will, you've been such a dominant uh, personality and person in the plant-based movement over the last several years and thank you for that. Um, but before we talk about the plant-based movement, I really want to talk to you about how you got into this world of health and wellness in the first place. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose to be a doctor and why did you go into GI? How did this all go down? Well, I guess let me start here. Uh, where I am today as an author and all these other things that I'm doing, this was never the plan. <laughs> I, I, it's bizarre to me because I'm a very type A goal oriented person. Uh, I create five year plans and I fully expect that they're going to happen. Hmm. And so when things change and I end up moving in a different direction, I'm just like, gosh, I don't know how that happened. But um, when I see an opportunity, of course, I'm going to take that. So for me though, where it all sort of starts uh, is I decided as a teenager that I wanted to be a doctor. And it, originally I wanted to be a vet, but I did not like cats. Um, I was very <laughs> concerned about cats. So like, I love dogs, I love other pets, but cats are no go. And so Ever since you were a kid, you had this incident or something. <laughs> well, there was never an incident. I never had a pet cat. And you know, the irony is that subsequently when I was in my, in my residency, I ended up getting a couple cats because I couldn't, I didn't have enough time for a dog and I That's wanted so a pet at home. And now I love cats and I've had cats, you know, basically like ongoing for 15 years, but Go figure. your whole yeah. career could have been different if you'd had that experience earlier. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I would have been a vet. So um, anyway, I ended up uh, choosing medicine and, and I wanted to be a pediatrician. That was my goal. Uh, I really um, loved the idea of trying to like make an impact and make a difference in, in kids' lives. And I was particularly attentive to teenage kids because I kind of feel like there's this critical period of time where it's like, you got to help these kids and get them properly oriented because this makes such a massive impact on who they ultimately become as an adult. And so I actually wanted to be an adolescent psychiatrist. I actually like worked at a camp up in, in New Hampshire one summer working towards this goal. And um, so anyway, I went to medical school. And during my third year of medical school, I started off with pediatrics right in the very beginning because I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm 99% I'm sure. And then I got in there and I was like, okay, I love the kids, but the parents, <laughs> y'all are driving me insane. It's amazing. We like, all have that same experience. <laughs> you're, you're either like way too neurotic and down my throat, or you don't care about your kid, which is incredibly sad. And so I couldn't do it. Um, so then it's like, okay, here's the million dollar question that most medical students face. Are you a surgeon or are you a gastroenterologist? I'm sorry. Or are you a medical doctor? Right. And, do you think or do you cut? Right. So I was like, look, I, 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 I want to be a medical doctor. I enjoy attacking problems with my mind and trying to like un unpeel the layers of the onion. But uh, at the same time, I, I can't. I can't imagine like literally just being in the clinic all day, every single day for the rest of my life. I, I need to use my hands or do something else. Yeah. So gastroenterology was the space that really sort of allowed me to, to straddle those differences and be somewhere kind of right in the middle. And, um, and I fell in love with the digestive system. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, 
but like there's to me there's a lot to love there every single one of these organs that i'm considered the expert on the esophagus stomach pancreas liver small intestine colon and even the hemorrhoids <laughs> to me there's something you, you in love poo. Well. we got it we love that yeah. you, we know you love the poo <laughs> i do I do. Uh, I think it's, I think it's way underrated and I think it needs to be discussed more often, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, so, I like to tell people I, uh, I take care of the thoracic cavity and up. So lung chest above the diaphragm. That's where I like to live. <laughs> the diaphragm is the hard line. That's where we separate, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm below the diaphragm. I'm, I mean, I do have my esophagus in your space. Yes. <laughs> but so anyway, I, um, I started this journey and it was 2000 and probably five when I was in my third year of medical school. And I made the decision, uh, 2004, 2004 was when I decided that I wanted to be a gastroenterologist. And I did not emerge from that until 2014. So, and I never took any time off. Uh, I worked straight through starting when I was 18 and finishing all my training when I was 34 years old. And so during this journey, I, you know, as you did, Monica, we subject ourselves to this intensely rigorous process where basically the expectation is this will consume you and you better have a smile on your face as you are consumed. And so, um, you know, the problem is you're working six days a week, uh, 15 to 18 hours a day, sometimes 30 hours in a row, and um, you don't even have time to do your laundry. And so, shortcuts and conveniences become very important. And the reality for me was that I loved fast food. I liked the way it tasted. Um, there's no, there's no denying that. And so these foods that I really enjoyed that were inexpensive, they fit well into my budget. And guess what? When you go this way, you don't have to cook yeah. and you save fast. yourself time. Yeah. Super fast, super easy, cheap. Got it. So Taco, Taco Bell was my friend. Oh man, Taco Bell, post-call, 30 hour shift in the ICU. You haven't eaten in 30 hours. Nothing, nothing's better than a burrito, I know. <laughs> you spend 20 bucks at Taco Bell. It's disgusting. You eat all of it. And then perhaps the most euphoric feeling in the entire world is when your head hits the pillow in that moment. It is the best. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's hard for people to understand. I totally understand. It's so funny. And then you sleep for 18 hours, right? And you wake up at 6 a.m. the following morning and you go back and you do it again. So, so that's my life. And you, you, you know this, Monica, you can relate to this. We all go through it. This is not specific to me. This is medical training. Uh, and, and there is a lot to it that I frankly believe is necessary. I mean, I do believe that it's necessary for it to be rigorous and to, be, to uh, involve a lot of time at the bedside with a patient. So, but anyway... I paid the price for this life. I paid the price and it caught up to me when I was in my early 30s, um, transitioning between being a chief medical resident at Northwestern in Chicago into being a gastroenterology fellow at the University of North Carolina. Um, and I was in a bit of a unique training program because I was on a grant from the NIH and I was also doing epidemi an epidemiology fellowship. And so, but in this, my professional career is way beyond my expectations. I huh. uh, won the highest award in my residency program at Northwestern out of 60 people. They paid for me to get a, a master's of clinical investigation from Northwestern. They made that free. I didn't even pay for my books. But on the inside, I am hurting. Uh, I was 50 pounds overweight. I had high blood pressure high cholesterol, um, very low self-esteem, tons of anxiety. And my ideal way to spend my time would be to curl up under a blanket in a dark room by myself. That's the way that I felt. Like that's seriously where I was. Yes, that, that, that feeling, um, it's interesting how it manifests in so many people so differently and, and how we respond to it because so many of us have felt that you know, um, that internal anxiety, that internal fear, and we internal, we keep it all inside, right? And, and then outwardly, you're winning all these awards, and you're super successful, and everybody wants you to be on their team. But inside, you're just trying to get through the day, you're just trying to figure out how to sort of make that anxiety feeling go away. And I appreciate you commenting on that. 
Yeah, totally. Because, well, I think that this is the one of the things that I've uh, learned through the years is that people can look great on Instagram, but you don't really know what's happening in their real life. Right. And you know, it's so funny that you bring up Instagram because this is my new obsession is that I can't understand how to navigate it where you make people feel good. Right. And so I, I feel like, um, you know, the further I get more involved in social media and Instagram, I feel like I, I'm not sure that I'm connected, you know, and so I, I struggle with this. So, you know, the more people look on social media, Kylie and Kardashian, Kardashians and all those people, um, and no disrespect to them, it's just that, you know, you feel worse and worse about yourself. And, you know, my daughter is 13 and she's asking me for Instagram. And so this is why it all comes together here, where I think is is the, the, the idea of social media to bring us all together and more unified has actually kind of left so many gaps in sort of our, our um, there's so much more loneliness and there's so many more gaps in that connection because of it, you know, and that, that I, I find that super confusing. I mean, I use it, I support it because it me grow a brand and it helps me grow a nutrition message, but I do find it confusing because of the, the loneliness that social media can create. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it. I'll be honest. I don't like it. People might think that I do based upon what they see of me on the internet, but I actually, if I had my way, I would be spending as little time as possible there, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, there's a reason, and I guess I should share that reason. There's a reason why I am there. Um, so uh, I'll build up to that. What, what happened in my life is that um, I knew, I knew that I didn't feel well. I knew that I needed something to change. And I, I figured, you know what, what if I exercise like very rigorously? Cause I was a single male. And so, you know, I, I could like find the time to go to the gym six days a week and spend 90 minutes and um, each time. And uh, the problem that I discovered, which surprised me is I couldn't exercise my way out of it. Like it, I could grow stronger. I could run faster and farther but I couldn't actually lose the gut or make myself feel better. And then my life changed when I ironically met the person who is now my wife and the mother of three of my children, all three of my children. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> yeah, it came out a little weird. I was like, okay, I better, I better specify that one. <laughs> How many kids does this guy have? Um, so anyway, uh, I meet this woman and you know, I could have never predicted that, that like what would happen in the 10 years that would follow. But we were just quite simply at dinner on a first date at this restaurant called Acme in Carborough, North Carolina, which is basically right next to Chapel Hill. And, um, you know, I, I, I look over because this is like pork country. I'm ordering the pork job. And I look over and this person is ordering stuff that's not even on the menu. She basically says to the waiter, can you bring me uh, collards? and black eyed peas and mashed potatoes and just put it on one plate and make it look nice. That's it. Hmm. And so the waiter's like, sure. Yeah, we can do that. And it comes out and I'm just like, yo, who, who are you? <laughs> what, what is this? Go, what is going on right now? Are you one of those? I don't even know what they are. Is it vegan? Is it vegetarian? What is this? Like, are you I, one of those? <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I didn't even know what the proper terms were, to be honest <laughs> with you. I didn't know the difference between vegan and vegetarian 10 years ago. I uh, had never been around anyone like that. And, but here's what I did observe is that she, um, she loved her food as much as I did. She cleaned her plate. She ate until she was full. She looked amazing. Uh, she seemed to have her health in alignment and it was effortless. And um, after we were done, I was like, okay, I got to figure out like how to get out of this date because I'm exhausted. I need to go home and sleep. I'm, you know, I need to put on some sweatpants. Wow. And she was like, yo, let's keep going. You want to do something else? Let's go somewhere else. And so it was enough to open my mind and, and ponder the possibility, maybe the food that I was raised on, maybe the food that frankly I love and that has been celebrated in my family is actually the problem. And so I didn't make any radical changes. Uh, I did not instantaneously become vegan. Instead, I chose to make a simple, convenient substitution. Rather than going to Hardee's, uh, where for $5, they'll give you about 2,500 calories. 
I chose to go home and pull out the blender hmm. and throw some stuff into the blender. And for a single guy who doesn't know how to cook, that was good. <laughs> okay. But that's an improvement. I think that I think that that's so many of our patients, aren't they? Are they start in that space that just like you and 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 you know that's why sometimes these extreme like you have to change all these things are hard. But you did what you made a small step and you were willing to say, you know what, I, I something maybe isn't right here, but let me try this one change. And that's a great place to start. I always tell people that you know any change is good. Any change oh. is good and change you know start somewhere. I instantly felt energized. I felt like something that was like almost like a, a weighted blanket. I mean, I know that weighted blankets, like people really like them, but imagine like your body is being held back. And I felt mm. like this was lifted off of me. Mm. And um, it was enough to make me come back and keep doing it. And then as I'm doing it on repeat, my skin is clearing up. My hair is growing thicker. And over the course of months, not instantly, obviously, but over the course of months, my body starts to change. And then I start to make other changes. You know, like I can substitute something for soda. I'm drinking two liters of Diet Mountain Dew a day. Let me find something else. My coffee that I'm having four times a day always includes the heaviest cream possible and three packets of Splenda. Let me find something else. How about just black? But and how do you do that? How did you, um, you know, a lot of people describe, you know, the most of America is sugar addicted, right? And so when you were to say, I, I was having three Splendas or I was doing so many and then I just went to black, were you able to make that transition just like that? Or did you go with an in-between or how did you work with your sugar addiction? Well, I didn't, I wasn't like simultaneously juggling my switch from Hardee's to smoothie and my switch from, you know, uh, Diet Mountain Dew to say kombucha and simultaneously you know, uh, super sweet coffee to black coffee. I didn't do it all at the same time. Yeah. Good. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically lining up goals and targets and I'm taking on one at a time. But then when you do that one couple of weeks in a row, all of a sudden you feel like, wow, this isn't hard. Yeah. Not as bad as you thought it would be and more attainable. And then you start to adapt to it where you start to enjoy it. You don't expect that to happen, but it does. And, uh, and then it's just a healthy habit that is locked in and you're ready for a new goal. So that's kind of the approach that I took and it transformed my life. Hmm. Um, and, you know, fast forward years and I end up back at my high school weight. And right now I'm in my forties and I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. Isn't that amazing, huh? It's amazing how we can go sort of there and then come back and be like, wow, I'm older yet. I feel like I'm 20 and I feel yeah. like the best 20 I was better than that. I was at 20. Right. Amazing. Well, I definitely feel a lot mentally sharper than I did in my twenties. That's for sure. So, but well, since and, considering you were a superstar in, in residency that the sky's the limit for you. Well, uh, you know, I just, it's, it's amazing it's amazing how adaptable our body is. Yes. It's amazing how capable we are that we don't even realize it's beyond our expectations for ourselves. So, mm, and that's not, that's lovely. and it's not to say that, that we should therefore expect to be superhuman. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that um, one of the things that I really believe in is a growth mindset. I've talked about it in my books and to me, this means letting go of success and failure and instead prioritizing progress, period. That's lovely. You know, we lived in Malaysia for a while and we went to, my kids went to an IB school and they used to talk about, and my kid was nine years old, the first time I heard about a growth mindset. And she said, we really encourage the, it was a British school, we really encourage the children to have a growth mindset. And um, I was like, oh, okay, tell me about that. And she was explaining it. And so she said that she gives the kids homework and she gives, she was giving my boy um, work and like tests. And the way they would do the tests was it was based on chili peppers. So the, the small one chili pepper versus very hot, which would be more challenging to yourself. So mild, moderate and severe heat. And the kids were supposed to sort of challenge themselves by themselves. And it was interesting. So I said, oh, this is so great. What is my son doing? <laughs> He's like, well, he's stuck on the one chili pepper. <laughs> it's like, oh, 
know, you know, but you know, sort of funny. That's where I heard about growth mindset the first time, but it is true that over time he started, he started doing the higher and higher chili peppers. I love that you talk about a growth mindset and it's such a oh. fabulous and important concept. We fail so many times a day, <laughs> right? Like so many times, this is not just like big, big goals and aspirations. This is like every little thing that we do, we make choices. Right. And we make a lot of mistakes and we may get most of them right, but we get a lot wrong. And so if we're going to beat ourselves up and like, you know, feel a bee sting for every single mistake, we're going to feel very low and, and, um, and in, uh, inadequate as individuals. Whereas if we focus instead on, did you put in the effort? Yes. Did you try your best? Are you trying to get better? And if you focus on those things, then it doesn't matter whether you win or whether you lose, because frankly, we're all just here doing our best and we are imperfect humans. Yes. Beautiful. I love that. I often tell people it's not try to focus on what you did wrong yesterday. It's about what you're going to do better today. Or I tell people like, accept what your body has to give, but then try to push it just a little bit more every day. Totally. And I think that that's exactly the same, right? Just don't you know, it's not about, uh, it's not about the end game. You know, people often call me, uh, as you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I have a very advanced form of it and, and I don't take any medications for it. And so a lot of people reach out to me and say, you know, well, um, how do I do what you did and cure myself of this illness? And that's something I get asked about every day. And I tell people all the time, just like you said, it's not about the end. It's not about sort of getting to that cure. I mean, hopefully we'll all get to a cure, but uh, the goal is just to get a little bit better every day. And if we stop focusing on, I have to be cured, I have to get off medications, then we're not disappointed. We just try every day to get a little bit better and be a little bit more successful and work on the process, as you point out, and not sort of the end game. Well, that's that's very true. And if we use rheumatoid arthritis as the example of, of what we're guiding ourselves towards, right? If this is a... Um, uh, black and white, like I either cure it or I don't cure it and I fail if I don't cure it, then it can actually mislead you and, and lead you towards poor choices actually, because the problem is you say, okay, so a plant-based diet, like there at this point is overwhelming evidence, you know, better than I do, Monica, but there is of all of the rheumatoid uh, conditions out there, yeah, overwhelming evidence in favor of a plant-based diet for rheumatoid arthritis that is the way, but it's not going to cure every single person who follows right. the diet. You should yeah. not feel bad about yourself if you take this diet and do your best with it. And number two, if you do your best with it and it doesn't cure your disease, that doesn't mean that it's the wrong diet for you. It just means that you are one of the many people who you do your absolute best when it comes to diet and lifestyle. This is just, I'm, I'm using this actually as yeah. a framework for yeah. uh, the way that I think we should all be approaching this, our problems, health problems. Do your best with diet and lifestyle. Take it as far as you can possibly take it. Follow the evidence, which basically guides you towards proper choices. But then when you get as far as it will take you, this is where we allow 21st century healthcare to kick in and provide us with what we need. And not to be afraid of medications and not to be afraid right. they work. They're super effective. And exactly, if you, if you stay on a good lifestyle, think, I always tell people like, if you move on this path, then, and you imagine how you would have been if you hadn't been on this path, like you can get so much better. And yes, maybe it's not the old game, the end that you were looking for. And maybe that's the problem, right? It's not that you should be looking for that cure or for that final, you do the best you can, you push it as far as you can, and don't be afraid to use medications if you need it, because we're, we're imperfect people. I like that. I mean, we're, we're, we are ultimately flawed. Nothing is perfect. We do the best we can. Um, flaws are fun. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we're, we're, we're entertaining. We're entertaining because we're flawed. If we were all perfect, we would be so robotic and boring. <laughs> no, I love that. I, my husband always says to me that my flaws tell my story. Um, and I think that that's really true um, because I would say, well, these are the things that are imperfect or I'm embarrassed about this. And he probably is my most important teacher in my life. And he has always said things like off the cuff, he'll just say, well, you know, if you didn't have those flaws, I probably wouldn't like you so much, <laughs> you know? And I, I do think that those flaws are what make us right. And in, in, in that famous star Wars uh, saying that I say to my kids all the time, although I tell them it's mine and not from star Wars, which is, 
you know, it's not how you fall, it's how you get back up, right? And so it's it's about sure. sort of the standing, it's the process of getting better, it's a part of dealing with the flaws that you have and the imperfections and making them better and stronger. I, I love that. I love all that you say. But so how did you then do this as a living? Like what, like you changed your life when, and how does your wife fit in? Because she sounds pretty fabulous. And you ended up getting together and getting married and having kids. Like, how did that all go down? And how did you get into the gut biome? That's not, I mean, most gastroenterologists, as you know, uh, don't know much about microbiota and they don't know much about nutrition uh, and speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, um, this, so picking up where we were before, you know, this transforms my life. I get my health back. I feel young and alive again after feeling like I would just want to be under a blanket in a dark room. And um, so it made me like, I'm a, I'm a medical doctor and I'm not here because this pays well. If this was about that, I would have been a banker, right? I'm here because this is what I care to do. I want to help people. And so this motivated me because gosh, if it can do this to me, what could it do for my patients? Hmm. And how come at these great institutions, I mean, full respect to my mentors who invested heavily into me, right? I don't want to make it sound like I don't value the people who put effort into building me into who I am. I'm here because of them. But at these great institutions, Georgetown, Northwestern, the University of North Carolina, why was I not taught this? And so I turned to the medical literature, expecting there to be nothing and discovered that there was an entire world of nutritional research that we just are not taught in medical school. And I became obsessed. I would work during the day and see patients in the clinic. And then I would read nutritional research at night. And I would bring it into the clinic the next day. And I'm watching people with irritable bowel syndrome, re like substantially improve their quality of life. People with ulcerative colitis going into remission who have struggled people with acid reflux throwing their proton pump inhibitors into the trash. And it gets to a point, Monica, where, again, like I always have a five-year plan. I think it's going to go some certain way. But I sat there and I said, this is not enough for me to be in this clinic one-on-one -on -one with a couple hundred people when the entire world deserves to hear this. And that's where I made the decision in 2016 to start a social media account. I didn't really want to do it. I don't like social media, right. but I felt like this is a story that needed to be shared. So I started it. And to be completely honest with you, it was as humbling as it could possibly be. No one cared <laughs> at all. Huh. All right. For years. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding you. Like no one cared. And um, so when you say that, you know, maybe explain that a little bit, you would write stories on social media, but that wasn't attracting followers, people weren't listening to what you were saying. And you were thinking what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting great effort into you know, hours of work. I mean, people, I don't know whether they realize this or not, but like a single post that I do forget my, you know, many, many years, decades of education and effort that have gone into building me up into who I am like literally just the effort to put together one post. I mean, it's at least 90 minutes, if not two hours. So I'm putting all this effort in. And from 2016 until 2018, I'm putting this out there. This I'm the same person. There is no pivot. Okay. I'm the same guy. It's the same message. But uh, people just weren't really attaching to it for whatever reason. I don't know why. Part of it is perhaps I could have been better in the methods of how I was approaching social media. I was figuring it out. But anyway, uh, in 2018, I go onto a podcast with Simon Hill. His podcast, Plant Proof at the time, now it's The Proof, was actually very new. And it went viral. And it was crazy. Like both he and I, we, sh we, we have become actually very close friends because we shared this experience where like friends were telling friends and this was exploding across the globe. And it was so um, moving that I said, gosh, people are really reacting to this. I feel like I need to do something like bottle up this energy how do I do that? And my wife was like, 
you need to write a book. And I've already collected I, six months ago. She's like, I knew this six months ago. I just didn't say anything to you. She's like, you wow, she sounds like a lovely woman. She's, she's, she's on it. So she's like, you got to write a book. And here are the list of like the 10 people that you need to reach out to, to be your literary agent. I was like, Oh, thanks, babe. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know what to do without you. So anyway, uh, 2018, I'll spare you the details on the book deal. It was really fun. Um, and exciting, but I ended up getting a book deal with Penguin Random House in 2018. It was a lot of effort too, to do that. I mean, this is not an easy thing. You have to convince people to invest into you and take a chance on you. And I'm glad you said that. And it's important for people to know that it's not like it was easy for you to get where you are today. So many of the times, right. Social media makes you creates that, Oh, you know, he just spent a little bit of time making these posts and bada boom, look at him now, but no, I mean, you, you sweat before this, you worked hard, you did a little bit of beg, borrow, steal, you know, you, you, you try to, you know, you hustled. Uh, you did what you did oh. and you tried to get going and it was, there was a lot of closed doors. Trust me, there were plenty of nights, plenty of nights where you've been working from 7.30 p.m. until 9 o'clock at night, maybe 9.30 on some social media post and no one's reacting to it. And you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I investing my time and effort when I already work too hard as a medical doctor and I don't have as much time with my wife and kids as I would like? Why am I, what am I, why am I putting myself through this? But when the, the podcast with Simon went viral, it became clear to me that there was something going on. There was an energy now. And um, so- that was, your, that was your tipping point. Yeah, it was. It was a tipping point because I also started to believe in myself. Hmm. Prior to that, I, you know, if you asked me a day before that podcast comes out, what's the future? I would have said to you, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do this. Yeah. And I don't know if it's that you didn't believe in yourself, but maybe you needed a little bit of validation that, that the time you're putting into this matters in that. Otherwise it feels like I'm not, you know, what, what's the point of all that I'm doing? And you just needed to have, you needed something to say, okay, people need this. I, yeah. my putting time in matters. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think that's a, that's a, that's actually a better way to orient it than, than saying I didn't believe in myself. It's more so it's more so seeing the value and the effort that I was putting into this because I was making great sacrifice in order to do it. And I had no money. Like I, I had no money. We're, we're, we're living paycheck to paycheck in my family. And I don't have money to put into this. I didn't have any money to put into this. So anyway, uh, but I get this book deal and that's November of 2018. And I basically spent the year of 2019 up at five in the morning, almost every day, writing the book. Uh, it was a year of effort and I did it. I was working full-time as a gastroenterologist and I was taking call every third night. So basically, if you think about 72 hours, 24 out of every 72 hours, I was taking call as a GI doctor and I'm writing a book. And maybe explain to people who don't know what that means to be on call, what would you get called about? What would you get called all the time? Did you have to go into the hospital? Well, first of all, as you know, Monica, when you when you are on call, there is no such thing as being relaxed, right? Whether whether you are receiving calls or not receiving calls, you are on. You are on. Yeah, you are on, and you have to be prepared to go at any time, and you cannot possibly sleep restfully because you have to be prepared that your phone could buzz at any second, and you better hear it. Oh, it, make, it actually makes me shudder because I can remember days I'd be nursing the baby and a STEMI or a heart attack would come in and, I, and I'd be on, on the phone and be like, how, let me see the EKG. And I'm on my phone looking at the EKG, trying to suckle the you know, baby's nursing. And I'm like, what's going on with my life? And it's not cognitively challenging. You know, I mean, the phone calls that yeah. I get, every single one of them, I know exactly how to handle them. It's not, that's not, it's, it's not a fear that I can't handle the work. Yeah. It's more so the, the um, persistent availability for anyone to reach out at any moment and consume you. And so, and, and, have, and having to be prepared to pivot away from like, hey, we got these plans, but boom, this phone call just happened. So now everything needs to change. Yeah. And so in gastroenterology, there's a number of emergencies that will get me up in the middle of the night and bring me into the hospital. Um, the most classic is a person gets food stuck in their esophagus. They eat typically steak 
and then they can't swallow it and it's actually stuck there and it's a it's a true gastroenterology emergency because when a person has that we call it a food impaction they can't even swallow their own saliva and there's very high risk for them to aspirate and if i don't move quickly enough they also could potentially cause irreversible injury to their esophagus aspirate meaning that the saliva and all the secretions will go actually into the lungs uh, right. and then it can cause them to have difficulty breathing have difficulty breathing, develop a pneumonia, yeah. you know, it's a scary thing. So um, anyway, so that, that was my 2019 is like, <laughs> I'm trying to write a book. This is a, uh, there's very high expectations. When you get a book deal, there's very high expectations. And I'm trying to deliver as a first time author. I'm not an author, I'm a doctor. What am I doing? Who like these are questions that I'm asking myself every morning. What am I doing? Yeah, questioning your self worth, questioning what you're doing. What the heck am I? What am I doing here? What am I even trying to accomplish here? Right. But at the same time, what what drove me forward was passion. I knew, I knew that I had something. I knew that this message needed to get out into the world. I knew that if I had the opportunity to package it in a way where I'm organizing meticulously every single word and laying out my argument, I knew I could help people. Mm. I love it. I love it. So here you are today with the Fiber Fueled book, which you have behind you on your screen. And I like to point out your Fiber Fueled cookbook, which is so fabulous, uh, just released, yay. So tell us about the cookbook and tell us about, you know, how, how did Fiber Fueled turn into Fiber Fueled cookbook and what's been, why is it important for people to read these books? So uh, Fiber Fueled was the, the motivation there for me. And I did not have like a multi-book plan. I wrote Fiber Fueled and then they wanted me to write more books. And I said, oh, I don't know about that. I, I'm kind of like, tired. I'm tired. I, that yeah. was really hard. <laughs> I was like, I'm kind of tired. I need a little space right now, please. Um, but Fiber Fueled, this passion project of mine, what I wanted to share with the world is there is this emerging science that is the gut microbiome that is revolutionary. And that is not being hyperbolic. It is transforming the way that we think about biology. And um, most people know nothing about it, including people in my own specialty. But the science is there. It is available. And it is exciting. Let me share this story with you. But let me bring a particular focus and attention to the fact that this is shapeable. You can make this what you want to be. And your number one tool for accomplishing that is your diet, specifically making sure that you get adequate amounts and the right types of dietary fiber, because that's what the microbes want. And recognizing that for me, where the opportunity existed is that if I go out on the street, 19 out of 20 people in the United States, this is not an exaggeration, 19 out of 20 people in the United States are deficient in fiber. Most right. are wildly deficient. Our so most what did you, maybe, maybe give, uh, well, maybe give them, give people a little explanation for people who maybe don't know so much about fiber and gut flora and gut bugs. Um, maybe just do like a, a two minute summary of gut bugs for us okay. and why they're important. <laughs> I know the two minute version, right? I mean, it's like yeah. this much and we just stepped into the elevator. The door is shutting and let me go. Go, All go, right. go, go. <laughs> so we, we have discovered that we don't live alone. We, we are not just a human in isolation. We are a super organism that includes microbes covering our entire body, on your skin, on your eyeballs, in your mouth. But they are most concentrated and focused inside your colon, which is your large intestine. There you have 38 trillion bugs invisible to the naked eye, but if you took a microscope, you would see this entire world of life inside of you. I love it. And they are connected to our digestion, our immune system, our metabolism, our hormones, our mood, our brain health, the expression of our genetic code. This is everything that matters. Everything, it's everything. I always tell people, I'm the one heart doctor that really likes poo. <laughs> Go well, figure. Because, I tried to stay away from this part of the of the body, and here I am, always below the diaphragm now. <laughs> as you know, yeah, right. And you you also you thought you would be sterile, uh, being uh, you know involved with the above the 
I was above trying to the stay above and, the diaphragm, and yeah, here I am. Yeah, I thought you would stay sterile, and the problem is we're we're bringing you down, bringing yeah, you down do, to the sewer, literally and figuratively. But you know, I think that that what's neat is is that maybe that the message here is that life is dirty, and um, you got to start with the gut. <laughs> Yeah, well, and also it's very forgiving, which is very exciting, right? So we talked about having a message of hope. Here's the beautiful thing. You are not a um, pre-programmed code for disease. You were born with, I would say blessed with, this community of microorganisms that's a part of who you are. And they're reflected, you know, basically in your diet and lifestyle choices. And the beauty is you change your diet today and you're sincerely research shows us that by tomorrow your gut microbes will change with you yes it's, so, it's beautiful it's beautiful we we did a study where we changed people's diet and within six days they had a totally different flora and all of their lipid they're all their cholesterol improved their blood pressure improved and all of it we connected back to the gut flora because you know what always drives me crazy is that People will say, well, if you change somebody's diet, it's because they lost weight. That's why their cardiovascular or their cardiometabolic parameters improved. But, you know, that, you know, there's so much more to that, obviously. And what we were able to show from our study was that even without weight loss, there was a significant change in all of these parameters, blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, I'm sorry, blood pressure, cholesterol, and inflammatory markers um, with, outside of weight in six days. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I'm involved with a company called Zoe. We're a personalized nutrition company and I'm the U S medical director. And we have multiple publications in nature medicine, basically backing up that it's the gut microbiome that actually is critical to our metabolism. These ways that you've described Monica, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes comes back to the metabolism, uh, comes back to the gut microbes. So it's all about poo. It really is. So <laughs> Yeah. So, and that's that, you know, this is, this is the thing is that you can, you can, once we point you in the right direction, once we pull out that compass and you know, okay, this is the general direction I need to move, then you can empower your health. This is what happened in my life without me even realizing it. But then subsequently I'm reading the clinical research and going, gosh, that explains it. This explains what happened and why I was able to reverse disease in my own life. And I think it's really important that you, you point out that it's not that the literature isn't there. The data is out there. It's just that we didn't get it in medical school because we aren't taught about nutrition and how nutrition and lifestyle impact the body. Ironically, every step two question um, for every USMLE question, when you have a, that will say, you know, how do I manage this patient? And the answer is always therapeutic lifestyle changes. Yet we know that therapeutic lifestyle changes is the answer, but we don't actually know what therapeutic lifestyle changes are as doctors. And it's that disconnect that we all as physicians or, you know, nine out of 10 physicians just don't have an understanding of what those lifestyle changes are. Uh, and you had to go out and get it like I did and just sort of start scouring the literature and figuring out, oh my God, there's this, there's so much there that we don't understand or that we as physicians don't understand. Yeah, and diet and lifestyle are, are, I would argue the root of most, not all, not all, I can, we can create examples where it's otherwise, but the root of most health related issues that Absolutely. exist. Absolutely, hands and down, I, I totally agree. Diet and lifestyle should be our very first choice in almost every single patient. And yet it is on the test. It is on the test, but it's never in real life. And right. that's just because of our lack of understanding as physicians about this, this area. So speaking of um, nutrition and nutrition and fiber, what would be three things that you would say that you think people should off the cuff do when they first start? And obviously knowing that like all of us, none of us did things all at once. Um, we did things over time. What would you say? Uh, so I would say the, the three things are number one, you need to start, you need to start wherever you personally are and take one step in the right direction. Okay. So this is not about like, Hey, I just identified your dream diet. And therefore I expect you like by tomorrow to be eating that way. That's not, that's not the way that we do this. I want you to create sustainable choices that you're actually able to come back and do again on repeat until they become healthy habits. One small step in the right direction. That's number one. Number two, uh, don't count grams of fiber. Don't count calories. Don't worry about macros. Yay. Count the variety of plants. That's what matters. Clinical research has shown us 
that each uh, type of plant has unique types of fiber that will feed specific families of microbes. We want all of our microbes to be fed, but they have their own unique dietary preferences. They're picky eaters like us. Before you tell me number three, then I want to just make sure that we ask that. So I, I like that you said that because so many people ask, well, what specific gut bugs are we focused on? And you know, I think we're so not near the point where we know and understand what bugs in particular, it's really just the variety and diversity that we're looking for in that different plants, right? Um, maybe speak to that. Well, even, when we, even when we understand uh, more about the dietary connections, and we do have research coming out on this, but even when we understand better the dietary connections to specific gut bugs, that doesn't mean that we're going to double, triple, and quadruple down on only a couple foods. Good it's going to continue to be this general principle, eat a wider variety of plants. Cause the problem is that our food system does not want you to do this. So you have to take it upon yourself to eat this way. But if you do eat this way, this is the dietary approach that allows you to support and nurture the most wide variety of microbes possible. That's the ultimate goal. I love it. Now what's number three, you gave us two. All right, number three, new data out of Stanford University. A couple of my friends, um, Professor Christopher Gardner, who's on the Scientific Advisory Board of Zoe with me, and Professor Justin Sonnenberg Amazing came out Justin. last summer. Yeah. Yep. Last summer, uh, fermented food intervention. Yes, that's a great study. We have suspected fermented foods to be good for us for a very long time in the gut health space, but this was the moment that they fully were proven from our perspective. In 10 weeks of increased fermented food consumption, they increased the diversity within the gut microbiome and they reduced measures of inflammation. We don't just eat plants, we eat wide varieties of plants and we should include wide varieties of fermented plants. Yay, I love it, I love that. Those are my favorite three, I love it. I think that just to emphasize again that it's not, if that Rome was not built in a day, it's okay to take time one step slowly build up a little bit of change every day, lots of probiotic, natural probiotics, uh, so important, loads and loads of fiber, and know that you can do this and that you have the power to change and that you have, there's so many illnesses that are preventable. And I, I really, um, I love that. Uh, I wanna finish up because I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna keep you too much longer, but I wanna ask you a couple, just two last things. Uh, what what is it that gives you? Well, let's do the the the, the, um, the cookbook first. I want you everybody to go out and buy this cookbook because it's so fabulous. And I want you to tell me what is your favorite recipe in here because I was debating which one I was going to try first. Oh my gosh, I got so many that I love. So I'm a big I'm a big lover of ethnic food. If you take if you jumped on like a private jet, I've never been on one, but if you had a private jet <laughs> and you flew around the world, you would discover that all these different cultures they love plant based meals. And so um, I, th this book is a celebration of cultures from around the world. Uh, given the choice, it's hard, but I'm going to go, there's, um, I have these uh, tempeh, so beautiful. these peanut tempeh uh, lettuce wraps. Oh, nice. And so like tempeh, you get your fermented food, lettuce wraps, it's a celebration of diversity of plants. So basically you like low effort are fueling a healthy gut microbiome, but guess what? It tickles the tongue and it's delicious. I love it. Let me ask you um, one important question that I think people often ask me and I'd, I'd like to hear how you'd answer it. Um, so a lot of inflammatory bowel diseases and a lot of small um, uh, gastroparesis requires you to eat low FODMAP or um, um, low fiber foods, low residue foods. And can you um, maybe help people that struggle in this space with um, understanding how they, they are to build up to eating those high fiber foods? I know that that's not an easy question, but maybe a little overview. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a nuanced topic. Um, people are under the belief that they need to go low FODMAP because when they go low FODMAP, they feel less uh, GI discomfort. Right. Well, that, that GI discomfort is the manifestation of a food intolerance. And the food intolerance is not the food that's the problem. The problem is the microbiome. Good. In these cases, the microbiome is not in a healthy place because if it was in a healthy place, you would be able to consume that food without restriction. 
it's no coincidence that you see this taking place in people that suffer with other digestive disorders. But guess what? You could see this in people who have rheumatoid arthritis as well, right? Because the connection is back to the gut microbiome. Yes. And when the gut microbiome is not where it needs to be, then when you bring into your diet the most high fiber foods, you're asking it to do more work and it becomes incapable of actually keeping up with the work that you need. So like Monica, there's like in the heart, if the heart can't keep up to the work that we need it to do, we call that congestive heart failure, right? Yeah. This is digestive failure of the microbiome. Yeah, that's, that's a, such a nice uh, explanation. Um, and I think that people need to hear that because um, they need to understand that, that it, it's part of the process and that you have to build up slowly, right? And um, you have to add in, the key is not to overwhelm the system, but to still continue to challenge. Yeah. And I think that the issue is that we, we need to recognize that the gut is adaptable. Yes. And we talked earlier about amazing adaptation. Your gut is capable of amazing adaptation. Your gut is capable of becoming capable. Your gut can become capable of processing and digesting these foods that you don't think you're allowed to eat. You don't think that you're supposed to eat because it causes symptoms. It can be trained. You just have to... There, my, it's actually my fiber fields cookbook, believe it or not, that's the most appropriate book for this, not just among my two books, but I would argue of all the books that are available, period, because this is what the book is about. The book is about overcoming food intolerances. And that's what I'm going to teach you how to do. And if you're, you don't have to have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis to do this. You could just quite simply be any person who's like, okay, when I eat this food, I don't feel well. Let me help you with that. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. And I, I see a lot of these patients, uh, you know, cardiologist hat, nutrition lifestyle hat. I see a lot of these patients in this space as well. And I appreciate that you brought that up and, and sort of, you know, digested that well, so to speak. <laughs> but I'm bum. Um, last, uh, last thought is, um, is sort of, sort of the premise of this is again, is to give people uh, the feeling of hope. And, you know, when I, during the time of COVID, I had COVID about two years ago with, before there was a vaccine and, you know, I, uh, all around us, we were, you know, doing so much PPE because I do transesophageal echo where I put the probe into the stomach. You do the, you do it in, uh, through endoscopy. And we were just in all this gear and we didn't know what was going on. And I, I developed COVID. And then after COVID, I, uh, my husband got shingles actually in his eye. So sort of, you know, there's been some correlation between COVID and shingles. And I developed a significant anxiety problem. You know, I had trouble sleeping at night. I had to, my hand, husband had to hold my hand and remind him, remind me that of all the joy and the love in our lives. And so maybe that's part of the reason that I do this because I think that there's so many people that are struggling with that anxiety and that sadness. And so I want to ask you maybe to end with is, you know, what is it that gives you joy and how do you overcome anxiety in your own life? And how do you, make yourself feel that peaceful feeling, um, to go through the day? I think that it's, these are, these are complex, uh, issues. So I don't want to sound flippant in my response because, um, there's a lot of people who struggle with these things and I have struggled with these things, but, you know, I think that to me, it starts by, um, settling conflict that you have in your life and loving yourself. Like those are the two steps that I think are critically important right off the bat. So it's easy to say, oh, well, just go do this or go do that. But if you have some sort of unsettled conflict in your life, it's going to be very hard for you ever from a um, mood or emotional perspective to get to where you need to be. And by the way, this is something that I talk about in both of my books, but particularly in the Fiber Field Cookbook, because our mood and how we feel affects our gut. And these are the people who can do everything right, eat all the right foods, sleep, exercise, and they still don't get to where they want to be. And the way that you heal them is actually to help them to resolve that conflict. Yes. And the, the other thing is, I just think that we need to love ourselves. When you love the person that you are, then you're willing to accept those imperfections. You're willing to accept those mistakes. And you let go of some of those fears of what the possibilities of permutations are that could occur in the future, but haven't actually happened because that's what anxiety is. And instead you just live and you celebrate these moments and you just let it go. And sometimes you fall on your face and you just, you shake it off and you laugh and you, about it. And you get back up. You know, somebody said, some wise person said, when you worry about something, you live it twice. 
um, because you go through it and then you worry about it so much, or you worry about, you know, and another thing that I love and I think about a lot is, you know, because when I first moved away from the University of Florida six months ago, and I still do research there, but I left them clinically, um, there was a lot of this, like, what am I doing with my life feeling? And I kept thinking to myself, well, if I just knew what the road looked like, then I would be okay. And um, a wise person also told me, and ML, Martin Luther King has also said something similar to that, which is that you don't need to know what the whole road looks like. You just need to lo- know what the road looks like in front of you. Mm. And if you just focus on that piece, then you'll be okay. And then arguably, if you knew what the whole road looked like, you might not go on that road in the first place or that the road will have changed because you knew it. And so I think that it's just sort of focusing on the moment in front of you, not learning to love yourself, which I love that you said that it's something that we all need to do more of is embracing our ugly and our dirty and our messy and imperfections and not feeling bad about the things we could have, would have, or should have done, but just focusing on what we should, that we can do now. Totally. I think that's great. Yeah. You know, you're amazing. You're a pleasure to talk to. I love talking to you beforehand before we got on the podcast and I love talking to you now. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is to say congratulations about your new baby. Uh, that's always a very personal thing. And I don't typically bring up family things because, you know, I'm so sensitive about my own, but I just wanted to say that, you know, you're amazing. Like you've taken, taken on you, the, the three kids, your zone defense, as people like to say, and, uh, uh, tell us a little bit if you like about the baby or not. Well, uh, this is my third child. My oldest is eight. My son is five. And then we have the new baby girl. And I ju- it just has been such a pleasure for me um, because there's these moments where it's like the squeaks and the grunts and the cries and the poops and the spit ups and all these different things are all part of like the, the joyful experience of being a parent. And you don't have the worries anymore, right? Of the first child stuff. No. And it passes so quickly. And so even though like I knew what we were like, we knew what we were getting ourselves into when she was coming and you know, the struggles or the challenges that exist. So you just, you take that on, but then you say, I just, this time around, I'm going to focus more on trying to enjoy it because yeah. it's such a special sort of, um, special and short-lived moment in your life. And so we're, we're having a lot of fun. That's awesome. I, I love ending them with babies because I'm so obsessed with them myself. So, and I think that you doing that is living in the moment, you know, focusing again, just on what's happening in front of you and not so much worrying about what's ahead or in the future or what might or happen or not happen. Um, and it's going to be okay. Um, that's something I say to myself all the time when I have the angst of, oh my gosh, that joint hurts. Does that mean I'm going to have a heart attack because my inflammation level is high and I'm at a heart attack and die? Uh, you know, you have to sort of take a deep breath and say, it's going to be okay. You're doing the best you can. Um, and it's okay. Love that. So true. Uh, you're awesome. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an honor to speak with you. Uh, please check out Dr. Will's books um, and just feel his energy because he has so much of it. And I think it's infectious and I, uh, I love it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone.